You're listening to a Mint podcast brought to you by HD Smartcast. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Why Not Mint Money podcast. Today I have invited Vivek Kaul, author of Bad Money, who will share five money lessons he learned by reading Morgan Housel. Morgan Housel is the author of the best-selling book The Psychology of Money. Welcome to Why Not Mint Money, a personal finance podcast where we help you understand basic money concepts and share strategies for you to build your wealth. So let's get started with your money journey. Hi Vivek, thanks for coming to this. My pleasure for yeah. You need no introduction and the person we are going to talk about also needs no introduction. But for the sake of it, when did you first discover Morgan Housel and why do you you know like him so much? So uh I think uh, this was 2020 when his book The Psychology of Money came out. And uh I don't know how I ended up reading the book but I did and I quite like the fact that uh, someone had written a book on money without uh, essentially getting into uh, you know the terms like stock market and sip and uh, you know normally what happens is when anyone writes a book on personal finance it tends to get a little too technical without essentially <coughs> talking about the broader philosophy of personal finance the broader philosophy behind uh, savings so savings more than being a financial thing are essentially or investing or personal finance or whatever you might want to call it they are more a psychological thing and it's the psychological side which interests me but does not get talked about enough so which is why i ended up uh, you know re- re- reading the psychology of money because i mean i had no idea who the guy was but the title i sort of found quite fascinating and you know and then his second book came out same as ever which was not a book on money but that also had quite a few money lessons so so that's how i essentially discovered the guy for our listeners who may not know uh, vivek writes you know uh, works as a freelance journalist and writes for a host of publications including mint right and morgan housel also works in a very similar way he writes one article per week and and you know vivek what i find very special is that you know my boss who is neil borate he once mentioned to me that vivek call is like the morgan housel of india and i'll tell you exactly the reason for it okay you both are journalists in some way but not the typical journal journalist so like i'll explain what this means so typical journalists we we go to fund man- managers we talk to them and we hope to get some insight from them insights information or so forth but you and morgan housel work very different right so you guys read the whole day take long walks think about it and somehow you know combine very uh, simple topic like how morgan housel uses biology uh, lesson history lesson same way you use movie or any god of cricket to you know sort of write about personal finance so so so, so what's your thought behind it I think the thought <clears throat> is that essentially people you know when you when you talk to people or uh, when you expect people to read you whatever you are putting out has to be interesting because there is you know the days when people would someone would just sit and read a newspaper or someone would just sit and read a magazine are gone now okay so you are essentially competing because everything is on the phone so you are not just competing with other people who are writing on similar topics you are also competing with netflix right so you are also competing with cricket you are also competing with insta reels so taking that you know scenario into account you essentially have to put out content as you know people don't call it writing anymore they call it content so you have to put out content which is interesting and how do you make it interesting you make it interesting by talking to people in a language uh, which they understand through stories that they know about through examples which are relevant at a given point of time like to give you I mean we are talking uh, you know uh, today today the fifth test match between uh, uh, india and england is happening has started in dharamshala and it's ravi chandran ashwin's 100 test and it is also johnny bairstow's 100 test so if i were to sort of write something on personal finance today i would try essentially getting you know either ashwin story or bairstow story or some data point from their careers into the piece 
so that would automatically you know i mean so the other thing it does is that the moment you put ashwin and money in the headline people are interested you know what is this about so that is the the basic idea it is to essentially talk to people in a language uh, using examples that they relate to vivek i'm really sorry for disturbing you during your cricket you know match but for context the cricket match is happening right now right yes i was watching cricket the other day and i think i also got you know a fantastic finance lesson so i was watching i think australia and uh, pakistan under 19 world cup right and the commentator casually was just saying that there is only a 37 or 20% 27% run i forgot the exact number but ah. of them getting selected in the national team which ah yeah. it was 27% basically you know once you have played the under 19 for your country the chances that you will make it to the uh, the, the senior cricket team are 27% so basically one in four individuals if we were to round it off who play under 19 cricket end up playing for their uh, nation as well and it, this obviously this percentage varies across different countries so i mean i know i mean i mean i have followed cricket for a while now and i know so many under 19 cricket players who did not really uh, make it in fact some did not even do well at the ranji trophy level even though they were uh, you know uh, they they did represent their country uh, in uh, in the under 19 Yeah, so, so. I think we have diverged too much <laughs> in, to cricket, but any money lessons you can think from this, you know, mm. uh, from this fact that very few people make it to the national team, even if they are in the. Ha, of course. So, so the money lesson uh, he- here is that uh, you know you might end up, you know, what what these fund managers call a multi bagger. So, a lot of multi baggers at the end of the day are obvious in hindsight. so your chances of essentially investing in a multi bagger and riding it are very very low to start with and by your i mean i mean i'm sure there are many people out there who have done it but i'm talking about you know at an aggregate level the probability is very very low which is why it essentially for a normal guy who who is who has a day job and who has family uh, responsibilities and who has other interests in life it essentially makes more sense to just invest in equity mutual funds through the sip route and not try to sort of you know take a punt on you know this stock will double or triple or so that does not normally happen. so it's it's probability basically so that's one lesson we can draw interesting and that was quick mm-hmm. and so yeah let's jump right into the main topic which is you know money lessons from morgan house Vivek has 10 money lessons but for this episode we'll take up five of them sure. and people don't need to know Morgan Housel or don't need to know anything about investment to understand this five points so here we begin so what do you mean when you say the Warren Buffett principle okay so this is something that uh, Housel talks about uh, see again you know he could have simply said the power of compounding which you know every second or uh, third personal finance article talks about but then you know if you say power of compounding you're like you know who's going to read mm-hmm. so what the, the story that he uses to essentially uh, bring forward the point about the power of compounding is that of warren buffett and uh, so i think this is there in in his first book psychology of money wherein he says that warren buffett made a bulk of his money post turning 50 okay so uh, i think the numbers he uses is that and this is 2020 so uh, so probably this would probably be 2019 numbers or whatever i mean that's not important what is important is is the principle uh, behind the story so warren buffett at that point of time was worth around 84.5 billion or some such large number and 84.2 billion of that was made after he turned 50 okay so this is the power of compounding now what what does it mean in very simple terms it essentially means that let's say you have 1 lakh rupees okay and and you invest that in a fixed deposit a simple fixed deposit total no brainer that at this point of time would probably give you a return of 7 7 and 1/2% per year 7% so that's 7000 rupees but let's say you have 10 lakh rupees so 10 lakh immediately the 7% on that would be 70000 so what happens so essentially what 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 happens is that as your corpus grows over the years 
and reaches a certain size in a certain number of years the power then the real power of compounding starts coming in because your money starts growing by huge amounts in absolute terms so as i said at 1 lakh it will be 7000 rupees but at 10 lakhs it will be 70000 rupees at 1 crore it will be 7 lakh rupees okay so which is why you know the the broader lesson here is that which is why the rich once you become rich you continue to be rich unless you sort of you know throw away your money in useless things so again you know uh, to sort of uh, related to an indian context an excellent way to follow this principle in india is to invest in the public provident fund i mean right now you do 1 lakh 50000 rupees every year and uh, it gives you 7.1% uh, interest every year and your uh, the amount at maturity is tax free so it effectively means around 10% return guaranteed by the government of india so it's a total no brainer but still a lot of people don't do it so you will end up i mean i, I mean i don't remember the exact numbers but uh, so you can keep extending you know it's it's i think for initially for a period of 15 to 16 years and then you can keep ext- extending it by a period of 5 years at the end of 30 years you can end up with some 1.6 1.7 crore which is for a totally automated investing strategy where you do not have to use your brains at all a pretty good amount of uh, money so which is what you know the warren buffett principle is basically about so you don't have to necessarily what i'm trying to say is invest in stocks you can even you know earn slightly lower returns but of course uh, uh, you know uh, guarant- in a way guaranteed uh, returns and follow the warren buffett principle so in other other uh, other way to keep it is you know instead of focusing too much on uh, earning extra return you can yes. focus on maximizing exactly. the exactly basically of- it's a see it's it's not a 100 meter sprint investing is not a 100 meter sprint it is a 42 km marathon and you have to you know and a marathon cannot be run at the spe- <laughs> speed of a 100 meter sprint so you have to pace yourself uh vivek do you remember the first story in the psychology of money book i think it's about this guy who is a janitor a philanthropist and a millionaire oh, yes something. of <laughs> course so there was this guy who kept buying stocks and i don't remember his name but when he ronald died reed, yeah what? ronald reed or something okay when he died uh, his portfolio was worth millions of dollars so he just kept buying and holding on to what he had so that is the i mean you know it's easy to so it's easy to talk about this but it is very difficult to continue holding on to what you have invested in just imagine you having a million dollars and not having a car or something yeah i mean i can imagine that for myself <laughs> i'm not interested in cars <laughs> you might be the next ronald <laughs> So, so yeah coming to the second money lesson mm. it's you uh, titled it the do nothing principle yeah, yeah so what does it mean you do nothing i mean so basically see so keep you you know uh, so let's talk about fund managers okay so fund managers in india have this at least they used to until a few years back they would tell you that uh, sensex has given you a return of 18% per year since 1979 or 19% i mean depending on the mood they would use any figure from 17 to 19% would be used and obviously they were not wrong about it they are right but you know what they did not tell us was that a bulk of these returns were earned up until 1992 when most of us weren't around investing in 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 the stock market right if you look at sensex returns from 1992 onwards and i mean i haven't checked the number in a year 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 and a half but from 1992 or a three decade period the sensex returns were around 9% per year okay so you add dividend yield of 1 1.5% so it's 10 10.5% so obviously in 1992 the markets were at a peak so i'm i'm talking from a peak level right so which is also not correct so i the number i like to look at is you have the nifty total return index data which essentially takes the dividends of stocks Uh, which constitute the nifty 50 index into account as well so from 19 that data is available from 1999 june 30th 1999 so the returns on that are around 13% per year okay so 13% per year is a is a is a fantastic number you know your money doubles in 5 to 6 years 5 5 and a half years so the do nothing principle essentially is to just <coughs> invest in these nifty 50 stocks basically invest in an index fund or an exchange traded fund and do it regularly 
month in month out or whenever you have some amount of money coming in and just you know it's it's like i mean you're too young to remember this there used to be this old hero honda ad which would you know uh, go fill it shut it forget it so okay. this is exactly uh, like that that's the do nothing principle because what will happen is what but then you know it's very difficult because there is so much noise uh, around the entire investing thing so there is noise on tv there is noise on um, you know in in newspapers there is noise in in digital medium now there is noise through financial influencers so it is very difficult to remain sane when the entire world around you is going mad or it least seems to be going mad so that's the do nothing principle at its you know it it's very core so vivek this sounds very you know simple but Uh, from my experience what i've seen is either people are hyper active on investments and trading mm-hmm. which basically mean they are doing fno intraday what not and on the other extreme there are people who you know completely ignore investing you know there are many people in between who you know so which is why what i said so see good investing should be very boring the moment you are getting a thrill out of it there is something not right about it so to sort of if i were to explain it to you in the context of being in mumbai where you know both of us are uh, so if you if you let's say go to one of these investing conferences which you know the season for which is currently on uh, so people will meet there and you know while they have their coffee probably in in the sun and and they'll ask you kya lagta hai so what <laughs> is it that you think so i find people who talk about investing to be extremely boring people because their lives are very very limited because they get excited by this just one particular thing you know, stock market where it is going stock market where will it go but ultimately see genuine money is made so i'll so to sort of take the thought forward you know you can become wealthy quickly <coughs> in three ways one is if you inherit money right I mean, two is if you steal it and three is the third is if you're lucky enough to be running a startup where a vc essentially invests a lot of money at a you know very huge valuation right and i mean there are always exceptions to any rule but as i said to become wealthy through investing is a process which takes time now obviously there are you know people who essentially get around this you know guys like rakesh junjunwala and but they are the exceptions which prove the rule that it takes time to get wealthy through investing which is why warren buffett also says you know that people should stick to investing in index funds so i i mean if you find index funds extremely boring then at least stick to investing in diversified equity mutual funds so you can do a large cap fund a mid cap fund and a small cap fund and and a gold etf and you're done and you can look at it a couple every two years and see also you know i find in mutual funds people chase short term performance which is a very stupid thing to do because short term performance keeps changing you know if you look at and i haven't done this in many years but you know when i used to look at mutual fund data very carefully the one year top performers would keep changing but if you looked at you know funds which did well over a period of 5 years that would be a more stable sample so you have to look at funds which are just you know the you know so if you were to sort of divide these funds into four quartiles you have to look at funds which are either in the second quartile or even in the top of the third quartile so because over a period of you know 15 years or 10 years a lot of these funds which might come out on top may not be the ones which would be perf- topping the charts in one year rankings but this is exactly what people do right because the apps are also designed because that way because it's exciting right apps what is what is you know app is essentially you know why i mean to be you know even though a lot of these apps are very user friendly at the end of the day why do you need an app to invest in a mutual fund i mean i don't get it you don't need an app you can just you know you can even have an a mutual fund agent and just go through i mean obviously then that agent and you need to be on your on on the same level because agents also have their agendas so uh, and i mean i say this i mean i have an app but i have control over i mean i don't like you know essentially change my sips every day or i don't do stuff like that so ideally you don't even need an app why do you have to sit in a local train and look at you know how does that help so investing decisions should not be made you know when you're looking at an app in a local train or in a cab or you know in in a metro somewhere it's not done so so 
So moving on to the next money lesson, it's you have titled it How Not to Take Cues from Others. Huh, well, so this is again, you know, because there is so much noise uh, related to investing at you know around us at any point of time. So it is again, you know, I mean, you so basically it goes back to you know investing in uh, in, in 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 the broader index uh, and uh, sticking to that. But the moment you you know if if you sort of try getting influenced by the world around you, you will end up doing things which are popular at that point of time, which might work. I mean, you know, if if you had you know if people who have Bet, bet you know bet their lives on uh, on small cap stocks in the last few years have done extremely well for themselves but the point again is that you know when when you start betting on something you don't know whether that bet will continue to be right in the future as well so which is why you know diversification is i think the most important investing principle and you know as we were discussing before we started recording this uh, in the last few years anyone who has said this has looked very stupid because it's concentrated portfolios which have done well uh, but then to sort of give you a few examples uh, you know you look at small cap stocks the you know the bsc small cap index which has i mean i think more than 900 stocks essentially reached a high it's then high in 2000 early 2008 it only crossed that high again in march 2017 9 years the same with the bsc psu index the high that it reached in 2008 was crossed only in 2023 so once you take start taking these factors into account you essentially you know uh, i mean you should generally be avoiding noise. Now, if you don't want to avoid noise and, you know, it it might just make some sense to have a small part of your portfolio playing on the noise as well. But you can't bet your life uh, on it. So, so to give Do you, you have a portfolio where you, you know, place these small bets according to, you know... I'm not good fans. at it. Yeah. I have <laughs> tried. But, you know, typically by the time I enter something, it is already <laughs> run up. So, which is why I like to stick to uh, stocks that I think I, I mean, at least in the, st- I, mean, the, the, I mean, I have a very small stocks portfolio, but it is largely uh, limited to stuff I think I understand. So, but most of the money is in, as of now, is, is in mutual funds and in fixed deposits. So, so the next one is a interesting one hmm. and you have titled it. See, also let me give you an example. So there used to be this philosopher called Burton Russell. So Burton Russell had this in, very interesting chicken analogy. Okay, so let's say uh, you are a farmer right? and you are essentially farming chickens. So you one of the, uh, you know, the, you're probably the most important job that you would do is to feed the chicken at irregular intervals at, uh, you know, every day. Now what? Now think from the point of view of the chicken. Okay. Now obviously no one's ever been able to ask the chicken what he's thinking about it. But think uh, for a moment how the chicken looks at the world that he exists in. He knows that you know uh, there is this guy who will probably come and keep feeding me uh, at a given point of time, any at you know every day. Now in his head he obviously assumes that this is something that is likely to continue. So essentially you know the human mind also works like that. We assume that uh, our short term circumstances will continue and that is how things usually are i mean most of the time but then one fine day the farmer essentially cuts the chicken because he's ultimately you know that that chicken is food on someone else's plate that is how it is meant to be right so the chicken's assumption goes all wrong so so risk is again something that you do not see coming okay so similarly, when I mean, I can give you the you know an example from 2008. Uh, that I mean, I remember it was a Monday, and we were in office having our weekly meeting. And during the course of that meeting, the Sensex the Sensex fell by 10 percent. Okay, 10 percent. Okay, on a given day, and then the you know the uh, the index had to shut down for some time, and all that happened. Now, obviously, you know when you know nobody had. When, when that morning big, you know, started, nobody really knew that Sensex is going to fall by 10% today, right? So that risk, nobody saw coming. So which is why, you know, as Mahindra Singh Dhoni keeps saying, it is important to control the controllables. You can only control what you can control. There's no point in trying to control what you cannot control. So controlling the controllables in this case means that 
you essentially as i said uh, diversify you know you don't bet your life on one stock or one mutual fund or one asset class or whatever is the flavor of the season now the point again is that you know there are people who you know who may go absolutely against this and do well right i mean that can also happen but all i'm trying to say is that since we cannot forecast since we do not know what the future holds for us so which is why we have to control the controllables that is what it essentially controllable means. in the sense so we can control our so emotions. we can we can control like like you know we can control the fact that we will not invest all our money in bitcoin okay though even though it's been going up uh, you know recently <laughs> with that but then you know so when you know uh, in I in 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 early 2021 I wrote some three four pieces where I said that bitcoin is a bubble and everything and people like went after my life and and they said the half fund staying poor and <laughs> and then it fell from some 67000 to whatever 2025 k and a lot of people who had entered in the last part of the rally lost their shirts and then the government cracked down which is a bigger uh, mess now of course if you had essentially you know spread your money across different uh, investment avenues then this would not have happened or you know it happens in a lot of small cap stocks people essentially so i you know i remember that when when this vodafone thing was happening i met this investor who had bet his life on vodafone stocks i mean you, know, you don't do that so that is why control the controllables diversify money and if you want to punt have a very small part of your portfolio which you can afford to afford. lose and a lot of us cannot afford to lose right so i think one of his uh, in his uh, one of his blog po- blog post i think morgan hausel also said something interesting i think he quoted some economist i don't remember the exact name but the quote is something goes something like this risk is what you uh, give me a second risk means more things can happen than will happen and yes yeah course. so so i think he took the example of covid right no one expected covid yeah i mean so covid is a great example so no one really expected covid to happen but yes. it did happen so and obviously people were tracking interest rate and you know all these other strategies but yeah. something which you don't see yeah lastly you uh, the fifth point is the importance of cash i mean so it's all again linked you know i, I so basically uh, so we live in an era where uh, money has been multiplying at a very fast rate right but so in this era trying to tell people that you should have uh, money in fixed deposits is it again sounds quite stupid but then as you know as i said this is again controlling the controllables so if if you know you cannot see the future you obviously have to be in a position where some of your money is sort of stored away so that if you were to enter a, a scenario of financial emergency you have money to get around it so i'll give you a very you know simple example at the beginning of covid a lot of people lost their jobs right and a lot of youngsters who were starting off did not have any savings okay now you know it might just be because they were starting off or they might have been a year or two old in 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 the profession that they were in and would have probably bought an apple iphone from their first salary yeah. and then gone on a holiday and stuff like that now what that did was obviously that it put those people in a precarious position now the second thing that happens is you know money in the bank essentially helps you negotiate better now what do i mean by that it essentially means let's say you lose your job and if you have savings let's say a year's saving or maybe even more than that in in your bank in your in in a fixed deposit or even in a normal savings bank account you do not take on every trashy job that is offered to you you are in a position to negotiate because you know that you have money to fall back upon or similarly let's say you have home loan emi is going on right a lot of people have middle class people have home loan emi is going on and if you lose a job at you know somewhere and it is it does happen these days right job losses are uh, pretty normal uh, uh, so how do you continue paying the emi you know you have to have some money stored away somewhere so which is why it is important to sort of again as i said it is important to be boring and have a part of your portfolio 
uh, obviously uh, in fixed deposit. Now that obviously the proportion depends on your individual uh, scenario in life. You know whether you have your parents are dependent on you, whether your spouse is dependent on you, whether you have home loan EMIs, uh, kids. What are the kind of expenses kids have? So it is an individual thing, but life becomes simpler. Uh, though less exciting if you have money stored away in, in a simple bank account this is actually very important i know one person who bet 40 lakhs in this crypto company called vault and it, it was pits as 40 lakhs yeah oh my God. It's, it, no it's so just, there are so many so such stories are pretty common but then again you know now what is happening is if you, you know with crypto going back again Going up again, uh, the volumes are also back. So people, you know, see that's the silly, th- that's the thing. You know, p- retail investors enter an asset only after it has sort of gone up, and then the the big guys come in and they sort of sell, make their money, and then <laughs> uh, these guys are sort of left behind. So I mean, it doesn't exactly play out like that all the time, but yeah, some of the times. So I think Vivek, we have completed the five points, but I'll give you one interesting uh, thing to do. So I'll just, you know, uh, uh, give a revision of the point. You have to explain that point in one sentence, oh one line. God. Okay. Just right. give it a try. Okay. For you know, revision is always important, sure. right? Sure. Before the exam. <laughs> okay. Okay. The Warren Buffett principle. Uh, regular investing, you know, whether you're doing an SIP or public provident fund or anything, so. The do nothing principle. Sit back and you know relax, watch cricket, watch movies, and do not get you know worried inherently worried about your investment every day of the week. How not to take cues from others? Again, I mean it's it's the same as do nothing uh, here. So, uh, risk is what you don't see coming. Uh, this is a tricky one. I mean, uh, so basically, uh, you know, the future is uh, not forecastable. Which is what it essentially means. I mean, tomorrow may not be like today. so, And you have to be prepared for that. The importance of cash. Again, tomorrow may not be like today and you have to be prepared for that. So, it's the same thing. God. Yeah, I think I've, we have completed, you know, our agenda. But but as a bonus, you know, Vivek, you write such awesome articles. It's engaging and, you know, you connect cricket with, you know, sport, uh, in, investment with cricket and sport. In a way, how Morgan House does it. So, would you like to give any like writing tips for us? Okay. <laughs> I mean, see, there are only, I mean, again, I might sound very boring when I say this. There are only two writing tips that I believe in. The first is reading and the second is writing. The more you read, the better you will write. And the more you write, the better you will write. So that is all because so, so what happens is when you read more, you obviously you know store away a lot of information in your subconscious, and essentially, I mean, I don't have a you know a, a, a very easy way to say this, but the more you read and the more things that keep getting stored in your subconscious, so then that subconscious essentially uh, keeps throwing that memory back at you, and then that memory essentially makes it uh, into what you. Right, and that helps you connect with uh, people at large. So that is all that is there to it. I mean, everything else, grammar, grammar, etc., you know, which people <laughs> make uh, you know a lot of hangama about, can be learned. And now you have softwares which can you know essentially yes. correct all that. So I think the most important part of writing is first reading, and then writing. A lot of writers who you know ask, I and mean, I mean this is not a pot shot at you, but. A lot of writers who ask such questions <laughs> essentially don't read enough and they, they clearly don't write enough. So That's true. Simple, sounds simple, but I'm sure it's... No, it is very difficult because, you know, you have to essentially every day, you know, be disciplined about the fact that uh, you have to read a certain number of pages or, or when, you know, when I write a book, I have to be disciplined about the fact that I will write 2,000 words every day, even though the next day I might get up and, you know, cut out most of <laughs> it. But then that discipline is discipline. important. Even on days when uh, the writing is not coming naturally to you, you have to sit and uh, write those 2,000 words. So that is the process. So, uh, folks who are watching this video, we still have five more lessons. But yeah, that's for, that's topic for another day, I suppose. Sure.
Thank you so much, Vivek, for coming. Thanks, for thanks this. for having me, Sachin. So. That brings us to the end of today's episode. If you would like to know more about this topic, then you can reach out to me on Twitter. I go by the username at the red Sachin NJ or LinkedIn using my full name, that is Sachin Ningthao Kongjam. We would be happy to take your suggestions. That's all from our side. Thanks for tuning in. See you in the next episode. To stay updated on this podcast, follow us at HD Smartcast on all the major social media platforms. To listen to more such podcasts, log on to www.hdsmartcast.com. Hold up. 